Good morning. Welcome to YCC. They are closing the back doors. Yep, we're getting started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. A few announcements as we get started this morning. First thing, next Sunday is our children's Christmas program, Fruits of the Christmas Spirit. And we invite everyone to join us. We will be doing the performance during both services. Uh, this is going to be just a fantastic program, I can assure you, because I've been there practicing with them. Well, I'm not practicing with them. I'm observing them as they practice. But this production is put on by our kids. They have written the script. They have picked the music. They are singing it. They are acting it. We have animals, as you will see. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So we encourage you to come. Bring your families. It will be a very family-friendly service. If you have a jam or a preschool toddler aged kiddo, even if they've not been coming to all the practices, they are a part of the program. We've been practicing songs with them during their Sunday morning time. So um, I will have a handout for all you parents this morning just so you know what we're hoping that they will contribute next week. So come join us, both services. We anticipate the second service being pretty full. A lot of times grandparents are coming, obviously for families, this service we have no problem filling up. So. If you would like to join us during the first service, instead of maybe when you regularly come to second service, please do that. We'll probably have a little more room during first service. And then during second service, if you are able to either park at the school or at the town park, that will, of course, free up more parking spots close in for those um, who prefer to park close. So we look forward to that next Sunday. Uh, many of you maybe remember that we did a fundraiser for Options 360 last year. On Mother's Day of last year, we passed out little plastic baby bottles. We encouraged you to take them home, fill them with coins, with your change, bring them back on Father's Day, and then we turned those into Options 360. And some of you have asked, how much money did we as a church raise? And you can see up there, almost $1,900 in all those coins just from our little church family. So praise God for that. Um, Options 360 does uh, a lot of good work uh, in our area for those who um, have unexpected pregnancies or who need support uh, during their pregnancy. So um, that's awesome. And that kind of inspired us for our next season of fundraising for our Building by Faith. A few weeks ago, we had a church meeting talking about different ways. The elders presented different ways to raise money for the next uh, phase of our building of our new facility. Um, as a church, you voted, uh, members voted, and agreed to transfer $75,000 out of our general fund to our building by faith by faith fund uh, for that next stage, which is buying the lumber package for all of our internal framing. And so $75,000, unfortunately, is not quite enough for that lumber package. So the church family also said, hey, as far as moving forward with raising money, we like the idea of biting off those small chunks at a time. How much do we need for this next step? Can we, in a certain period of time, raise that money? So enter the little blue box. And in the foyer, you'll see a display of these. They're a little bigger than we thought they would be, but hey, someone had said, you could probably fit about $12,000 in one of those boxes. <laughs> We're not expecting that, but we just encourage you as a family, as a couple, as individuals, if you feel so led, grab a box. And between now and end of January, we have a goal of raising $25,000 to complete what we need for that building package and then also the other things that just cost us each month in keeping that building program going. So coins, kids get involved with this. If you find change around the ground, I found two quarters on the ground the other day and yes, I picked them up. So when you find coins or you find that little money dish that sits by the dryer when mom empties out pockets, that's a great idea, throw it in the box. Um, if you'd like to give more than that, yes, paper money and checks will also fit in this box. Um, if you want to, it's big. You could put little notes of encouragement to our building crew and our team over there. You could put some little chocolates in here, get creative. But either way, our goal end of January is to raise the $25,000 that we'll need to purchase that lumber package, which we hope to do just after the first of the year. January, February time. So you'll find those boxes in the back and we look forward to seeing how God is going to use that. He used all the coins we put in baby bottles to raise almost $2,000. Let's see what we as a church family can do with those blue boxes. 
Uh, let's see, Christmas Eve service is coming up. Christmas Eve is on Sunday this year. We will have our usual two Sunday morning services at 8.30 and 10.30. And then we will have our annual tradition of our candlelight service, one service Christmas Eve at 6.30 p.m. And that is our candlelight service. We like to keep it brief because we know you've got a lot going on with family, um, but will be our traditional um, songs and candlelight and just a wonderful for you to join us for that. And finally, we have a work party coming up Saturday the 16th. That's next Saturday. Yes, next Saturday, starting at 9 a.m., we're getting the roof done. So pray for good weather so we can finish the roof. Um, you've seen the amount of rain we've had over this last week. I don't know what happened in the middle of the night, but we've got a pretty good pond in our front yard over the driveway. That's never happened. So the rain is here and it's not going anywhere. So we really want to get that uh, building enclosed. So pray for good weather so we can safely get that roof completed. And please join us next Saturday, 9 a.m. All right, why don't you go ahead and stand and join us as we begin our time of worship.
may be seated. I want to invite up Harley and his family for the Advent reading this morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is, <clears throat> I'm Harley, and this is my mom, my dad, and <clears throat> my older brother. Um, and we're just here to read, or well, I'm going to be reading the uh, second week of the Advent. So in Isaiah 9, 6, the prophet tells us, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And in John 14, 27, Jesus tells us, Peace I love, or I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, 
neither let them be afraid. Peace lives as, as a longing in every heart. Today we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. Peace is the original established order of God's created world. Peace saturated all of creation before the fall. Its desire is woven into the fabric of our being, which is why we all deeply feel and grieve its loss. However, all hope of peace is not lost. Jesus' promise is to give us peace, not peace the way the world defines it, but a deep and lasting peace that is not based on our present circumstances. It is a peace that is based on a restored relationship with God through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the gift that baby Jesus came to bring, peace with God. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding your <clears throat> standing, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus this Advent season. Thank you guys for doing that. Um, as we look at the candles, we just remember that Jesus is the light of the world. And, um, would you join me in praying? It's also the second Sunday of the month, so we remember to pray for our missionary of the month. Father, we are thankful that we get to be here worshiping you together this morning because your son Jesus was born and died on a cross and rose from the grave and your spirit lives in us through faith in Jesus. And we thank you for the new life that you give. We thank you for the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Even when we're walking through hard things, or maybe even in the holidays, some of us face things that cause grief or remind us of difficult things or have to walk through various trials or are able to celebrate with family and, and have good times all kinds of different circumstances, Lord, but your peace is not dependent on what we are going through. It is deep and abiding and lasting because you will never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you for that. And I just pray for peace and joy this morning in every heart here. Pray for those who don't know you, that they would come to know you, Jesus, as their savior. And I pray for those who do, that your peace and your joy would just run even deeper in our hearts. And we love you. Thank you that you first loved us. Season, pray for all our missionaries all over the world that they would have unique opportunities to be a light in the midst of a dark and wicked generation, as your word calls it, and uh, cause them to shine like stars in the night sky in those places and be uh, a beacon of hope for the people around them. Lord, we pray for our prayer family of the week, for John and Belinda Evans, that you would bless them and, and pray for their family, we pray for, for them and also for Joan and also their kids and just that you would be at work, whatever you have planned for them this year, that in those relationships that they would, you would be central. We pray for their kids that you would, you would rise in their hearts as the, the Lord of everything, that they, you'd be at the center and, uh, and just for any of their family that doesn't know you, that you'd be drawing them to yourself. And we thank you so much for them and ask your spirit to bless them now and, and throughout this year. And Lord, you've blessed us much. You're generous. We thank you for that. Receive back a little bit of what you've given to us in the time of offering. And um, we love you. Thank you that you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Joy. 
shadows to fly Light of the world From the beginning The tragedies of time Were no match for your love From great heights of glory You saw my story God, you entered in and became one of us. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah for the things he has done. Come and adore him, bow down before him, sing hallelujah. suffer to save. High King of Heaven, death is the poorer, and we are the richer by the price that He paid. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah for the things He has done. Some his own through clouds he will lead us straight into glory and there he shall reign forevermore forevermore sing hallelujah sing hallelujah sing hallelujah for the things he down before him sing hallelujah to the light of the world Check. Thank you guys very much. I want to dismiss the kids to their Sunday school time if they would like. Um, you know, I think, where to go. If not, just follow the kids in front of you. And if they leave the building, don't follow them there. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, I also just want to thank the Wells family, Harley. It's um, great to have you here. And I'm probably going to get, it's Ron, Felinda, Gavin, is that, did I get that right? So I remember when we first came to the church nine years ago, one of the parts of the church ministry was the Awana program. And I remember having Harley um, in Awana, and um, there was lots of life amongst those middle school boys. And... Uh, you may or may not remember this, but I really relied on Harley a lot. He was a, a um, strong leader amongst those kids, and didn't matter what I said, but if Harley said it, they listened. And I always knew that he comes from, must come from good stock. Never met Ron and Vlinda, and Gavin, you must be a great older brother, but um, it's good to meet you guys. Thank you for serving. And I will tell you that the most stressful part of the entire service 
is trying to make sure that that lighter starts to light these candles. It's like always the most difficult thing. I feel very compassionate for you. So thank you guys. A special time of year, our Advent season. And today, as, as they shared with us, is the candle and the Advent theme of peace. But today, um, I'm not going to preach on peace uh, because I'm going to preach on joy. And the main reason why is because I, uh, I want to. <laughs> is that probably the biggest reason? And I don't get to preach next week because of the awesome Christmas program and joy falls on next week. So we're going to be talking about joy today. And we'll be going from the book of Luke, Luke chapter 2. And you can turn there now into Luke chapter 2. As you're doing that, um, you can multitask as, as I pray. Jesus, um, as we celebrate your birth, we are reminded of the great joy that all who witness your first moments here on this earth must have experienced, and we are filled with joy this holiday season, just knowing that you have already arrived. And that you came to bring redemption, you came to bring forgiveness, salvation to all. And we are reminded of that this morning from this passage. Please do your work in our lives and our hearts. Holy Spirit, conform us to the image of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. It always happens, joy and happiness are two things that can tend to get smushed together in their definitions and terminology. And that's okay. I mean, everyone likes to be happy. I'm one of those people. I enjoy being happy. And um, uh, the problem with happiness is it's so temporal. It's so circumstantial. I could be very happy and then um, can get up in the middle of the night to go sneak a snack and in my happiness, excited about that pie that's in the fridge until I barefoot step on a Lego that's in the middle of the floor and my happiness goes quickly to sadness, then to anger, and then I go through all the grief process um, in that. Happiness is that way. It's circumstantial. It, it, um, it can be really great until any of life's circumstances comes against it, and then it crumbles. Joy is the opposite of that. Uh, joy is a different picture of that. We talked last week when we spoke on hope that... Um, the, to the extent that we would experience joy is based on what our hope is fixed upon. Where is our hope actually pointed to, sighted into? And if it's pointed in the right place, then our, we, our joy experience is full. Um, but that's a temptation that, especially this time of year, our hope can get focused in the wrong place. And talking about joy today will help us get our hope fixed in the right spot. So we have this song. We're going to actually sing it to close the service, and the song is Joy to the World. And it's um, a, a great song. Some say it's the most popular of all Christmas hymns, uh, most favorite. Joy to the World, one of the lines goes like this. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. So it's a special time. As we look at Luke 2, and we have to kind of get a bit of a context, so the context is in verse 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 of Luke chapter 2 say this. They say, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. So it's understandable, obviously, that they were filled with fear, these shepherds. And shepherds are an interesting, interesting group of people. They were pretty much um, outcast, not just because their job put them out, but also because they were always out with sheep and they, they were poor, they, were, they stunk. Um, they, they weren't the most, um, um, it wasn't the most highly anticipated or sought after job, at least in a cultural sense, but an important one nonetheless. It's interesting that... God chose to bring this news first to these outcasts. But in this moment, they're terrified. They see this angel. As they're terrified at this angel, the angel speaks to them in a tender way, in a kind way, in a soft way, and says, hey, verse 10, 
And the angel said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Good news of great joy that will be for all of the, the people. Don't be afraid. Uh, this fear that you're feeling, don't worry about it because good news has come and great joy will follow. And we know from last week that that culture was looking towards a savior, a messiah. They didn't know exactly or didn't all agree exactly what that messiah would look like, but the Old Testament prophesies about this coming king, this coming messiah, this coming Lord that would save them. This was prophesied over 400 times in the Old Testament. And the angel coming to these shepherds is the inauguration of the fulfillment of some of those earliest prophecies. And so this would have been um, certainly good news for them because it's tempting for a people, especially these people who had been lost in their own, their own life circumstances for hundreds of years. Um, they'd forgotten their hope. They'd forgotten about this coming Savior, thought that it would never happen. And so they hear this message and it is the cause for great joy and celebration. That's what we see in Luke 2. And it's so much the same also for us. We have the beauty of hindsight. We know what was being prophesied because we've seen it happen. It's in the history of our Christian faith that Christ the Messiah came humbly as a baby. And we get to play that out. And we get to be reminded of this um, incredibly valuable saying that our our mayor said at the Christmas tree lighting to the town, Jesus is the reason for the season. I'm sure all of you have heard that. And it's easy sometimes to let sayings that are so common to lose their weight, but we can't let that happen with this because this is why we are here, especially this morning. And it's a time for us to remember the, the weightiness of this. This, this joy that we have because of the good news in which we've experienced, that we've received by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're a people that can drift away from the understanding of that. And so we come here this morning, we come here week after week and we're reminded of the hope that we have in Christ. And it's so important, especially this time of year, because I know I'm not the only one that gets caught up in the the hecticness of this season where we're, we're easily persuaded to get sucked into the consumerism, sucked into the commercialization of the season. And for me anyway, it feels like there's this, this warp speed that happens once Christmas or Thanksgiving hits through New Year's. Like that time goes by so fast, so much happens, and then it's gone and I think there's, and, and, and I'm broke. All of those things, I guess, could have fit into there. Um, that is something that we um, have to guard against and be ready for. And that's the beauty of why we celebrate Advent this time of year. To slow, to remember that he is truly the reason for our season and not to forget that. So joy to the world. Um, it, this song, I'm just going to read it again. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. And then pay attention to this next line. Let every heart prepare him room. As your heart prepared him room this season. As your heart prepared him room. What does that look like? Well, I'll tell you this. It does not just happen. It's intentional. You have to make the choice. Um, as you're led by the Spirit of God in you to make the choice to prepare your heart to give him room. As I think of this stanza from Joy of the World, it makes me think of um, probably the most famous of all, Chris, or all verses, not Christmas verses, John 3, 16. For God, he so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son so that whoever might believe in him, they will not perish, but have eternal life. And, and those words are tied into this so well because we hear of the good news and the great joy. And as verse 10 of Luke chapter two tells us, it's for all people. Let that sink in. The message of Christmas, the message of God's love and the gospel of Jesus Christ is for the world. It is a message for all people. 
not just religious people, not just clean people, not just rich people, not just poor people, not just people that are down. It's for all people. That's the heart behind it, that Jesus came to share this good news of great joy, and it was for the world to hear. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This is a news because it is for all the world. It is our opportunity to shine that light to those around us. That is our um, responsibility. It's our debt, but it's also our great joy to be able to do that very thing. And we can do this in so many different ways ways to share that life and that love of Christ with the world. We can do it just simply through the way in which we celebrate this season, through being reminded, why do we celebrate this time? Why do we give presents? We give presents because we've received the greatest of all presents in Christ this time of year. And it's a good reminder to us that as we see the joy on other people's faces, it might renew the joy that we have had when we first came to know the Savior. When we realize that the burden of our sin was not ours to fix, but Christ had fixed it finally on the cross when we trusted him by faith. Why do we go out of our way to see family? Well, Christ came out of the way, out of the comfort of heaven to make a new family of which those of us in here who have accepted Christ by faith are part of that family. As we come to a close today, I wanted to have a very good Christmassy conclusion story. And I couldn't come up with one. So I gave a good hunting story, which is more appropriate, I think, anyway. Many of you have asked me, hey, we haven't heard about any of your hunting stories this season. And then you quickly, out loud, would say this, that must mean that you didn't get anything, which is hurtful, just so you know, (laughs) and very true at the same time. Uh, Elk season was a bust, and it wasn't, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. There were no elk in the woods. Um, Three weeks ago, no, there weren't, really. I'm not, that's not an excuse. There weren't. Ask anybody that didn't see any elk. So a few weeks ago, over Thanksgiving, my family, um, the guys in my family, for 30 years have gone to the same spot hunting in eastern Washington, southeastern corner, kind of the gateway to the Hell's Canyon area, beautiful area. And um, as my dad has said many times, next to Jesus in our lives, nothing has served our family more than um, the hunting trips where we've gone out and, and shared experiences together. It's built our family strength, but I'd agree with him with that. Well, this particular season, um, a few weeks ago, uh, we've had the blessing of harvesting a lot of animals over 30 years in this part of the world where we go. And um, this was going to be a special season like no other. And I'll just say the opening opening um, day when I was there, I had a, got a great hunt on some, some deer, and it came up this nice little legal three-point buck. Um, wasn't a wall hanger, but it would fill the freezer and um, put a perfect ton on Everything was great. And 75 yards, broadside, right in front of me, had no idea I was there. I had all the time in the world. Rested, aimed, shot, missed. That happens, right? It happens. And so I'm thinking, all right, it's first day. I don't want to get it here on the first day. What's what fun of that is there? So the next morning, saw some deer, 1,000 yards out, put a stock on them. And it was like, I don't know if this service knows Marty Stauffer like first service does, but it was like a Marty Stauffer, like had this deer that fed this very nice, biggest buck I would have ever shot in 30 years, fed within 65 yards of me, broadside. I was seated um, behind this sage bush with shooting sticks, no problems, dead deer, right? 65 yards, no clue I was there, crack, shoot. Waited for the, it's muzzle loading, waited for the smoke to clear. The deer was running away. Missed. I'm like, what in the world? Went 100 yards this way, stood broadside, well within the range. Quickly reloaded the gun. Shoot. Miss. Just absolutely flabbergasted. On that shot, in hindsight, I realized in my excitement when I re 
fed the, the muzzleloader and put, put with the ramrod. I forgot to take the ramrod out, so I shot the ramrod with the bullet. So that, I don't know why I actually share that out loud. It's kind of a, but, um, so I'll chalk that one up just to, it, um, then, um, so I went, I, this deer is, I feel like it's blessed by God. It's not going to get taken by me, but I'm still going to chase it anyway because I watched where it went. And so I went hustling down this fence line to follow this deer. And over on this side of the fence was private property. This side of the fence, I have thousands of acres to hunt. And as I go over this knob, I stop in my tracks. And just to my left, 20 yards in the private property is and the largest buck I've white-tailed deer I've ever seen in 30 years, bedded down, looking right at me with his girlfriend. I freeze, we look, I'm looking, and um, only because of the work of sanctification and the Holy Spirit in me, I, I literally, I, I'm not lying, I was not tempted to shoot that deer. I don't know why in my younger years I would have been very tempted, no one would see it, I could just shoot it and drag it over the fence. I did not do that. And as I was reminded by a good friend who says, you should never do anything that you may make you lie. And if I had shot that, someone would have asked me if I shot on that side of the fence and I would have been tempted to lie. In any case, didn't shoot that deer. I just, it was like a stare down, an old Western movie. We're looking at each other. He's looking at me. And, um, and then I had this great idea that if, if um, I bumped him, scared him, he might get up and run and jump over the fence on the, the good, you know, the legal side. So I was like, you know, and he snorted at me with his girlfriend, and they ran straight down the fence on the private property over the hill. So I run after him. I go over the hill, and I look, and there they are at the very bottom of this little draw, and guess what? The girl jumps over the fence, and like every good guy, he follows the girl, and he jumps over the fence into the legal area, and I shoot, and I miss. Um, and then he went around, he was at 200 yards, which is way too far for a muzzleloader, and in my immaturity and my frustration, I lobbed a bullet, and for the fifth time, I missed. Okay, so now it's, um, yeah, tail between my legs, lunchtime, go back to the bottom of the ravine where the river is, where we eat lunch and shoot our guns, and I go to sight the gun in, and at 75 yards, the gun is shooting a foot high. That's a lot, if you're not a hunter, that's a big difference um, at 75 yards. Now, what I haven't told you up until this point was that I borrowed this gun. I borrowed it from Jess Seekins, who was the guy playing the electric guitar right here, okay? And um, to Jess's credit, when he gave me the gun, he said, Bill, make sure you shoot this before you take it out in the field, because it's been a while since I've used it. Well, guess what Bill didn't do? Bill didn't shoot it. Um, and he went out and had the experience that I just shared with you, which I'm lucky to get one shot at a nice buck every few years. I had five shots at three different deer with a gun that I had incited in. And it, part of me, when I realized the gun was that far off, part of me was like, whew, I'm, I know I'm not a great shot, but I'm not that bad of a shot. And whew, it wasn't me, it was the gun. But then the other part of me was sick because... I skipped such an important step. Very irresponsible. I could have wounded an animal. I just outright missed five times, but in some cases I could have wounded it. Now, what's the stinking point, Bill? This is the point. The simple point is, I think that is the human condition and the great temptation of every one of us is to live our life with our hope sighted in, in the wrong places. We're, we're way off. To the extent in which we experience joy is based on where our hope is fixed. And all of us, not just in this room, but all humanity from the very beginning has been attempted to fix their eyes and their hope on things in which cannot bear the weight of what it requires to bring a true joy and, bi and biblical joy in your life. We have our hope fixed upon a career, on, on a spouse, on how well our kids turn out. Maybe our hope is fixed upon our health or someone else's health. Our, our hope can be fixed on our accomplishments on the fact that we're a better person than we were a few years ago, 
Our hope can be fixed on a relationship or a desired relationship. Hope can be fixed on a school destination. And the list goes on and on. When our hope is fixed in those places, in a spiritual sense, it's as damning to our joy as me going out hunting with a rifle that is so far um, off target. And that's just the nature of things. For people that say that they come to know Jesus, they're saved, and everything's good, I don't, I don't really need anything more. I don't need fellowship with the saints. I don't need to go to church. Um, you know, God knows my prayers. I don't really need to walk in a prayer life. I don't need to be disciplined in my time in reading the word and my time in confession, my time in solitude and any spiritual discipline. That's like a person that's walking around with a gun that is sighted in inappropriately because here's the reality. With any gun, even if it's sighted in when you put it away at the end of the season, chances are you're going to pull it out and bump it. You're going to bump it on something, and it's going to throw it out of whack. You should always sight it in. Our lives are exactly that same way. We are buffeted by life. We are buffeted by hurts, wounds from our past, wounds from people in our lives now. We're buffeted by the, the, the strains of culture and the constant message that what you have is who you are, or, or your identity is based in your sexuality, your identity is based in um, your, your success. This is our sights getting bumped. And for us, this time of year right now is so incredibly valuable for us to sight ourselves in to be reminded that um, our hope is not fixed anywhere, but in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And with that, when we have that as our, our focal point, then we can handle anything. Because the joy that has its, its foundation in the hope of Christ is a joy that cannot be overcome by any circumstance in this world, even the worst of the worst circumstances. And so for you and for me, our hope must be fixed on Christ and what he's done, and it started here as a baby. And our joy exudes from that. And, and what a beautiful thing that is, to be the type of person that is, no matter what circumstances you're facing, you can walk in the strength and the joy that comes, not from anything other than the work of Christ and the promises of God in Christ and through Christ. The old song says that my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's this time of year. As we look to this baby in a manger, as we light an Advent candle, we look at the different themes. Next week, as we see the work of our children um, share the message of Christmas in their own unique way, these are all Good reminders for us not to be walking around with our hope sighted in anywhere else. Please stand. We're going to close with a song and a prayer. Father, our hope is built, at least our prayer, on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Give us the strength through your spirit to walk in the spirit. And Father, we just we admit, we confess that um, our, it's easy for us to wander. It's easy for us to bump our sights and be off target and off aim. We thank you that um, all the real work for all the things in which would create us to be a joy-filled people has been accomplished by you. And thank you that as we look to Christ, we are reminded of the joy that we have in him and the hope that we have in him. May that be an experience in our lives this afternoon and for the rest of this season, which will be constantly pulling at us. 
may that be an opportunity for us um, to reproclaim um, our sights fixed upon the hope and experience of the joy that is only in you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. to leave you with a blessing, and I was going to go with the usual one out of number six, but in light of thinking about joy, I want to leave you with Paul's blessing from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. So may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Or you are dismissed. <laughs>